does not know the meaning of the second set of verses. The teacher only knows the meaning of the ayat which are muhkam, plain and clear. And the teacher... All of them. 
بعوضة من بين سجدة إلا إبليس If you if you extract this verse of the Quran and seek to understand it without reference to the rest of the Quran you cannot escape from the logical conclusion that Iblis was an angel logically you will have to conclude that Iblis was an angel and having done this cut and paste piece of scholarship you then announce on something called Facebook I don't know whether you know about it I've never visited yet but I'm hearing about it something called Facebook and you announce to the public Iblis was an angel during the Quran oh wait a minute Allah is teaching you a lesson you dumb dumb If you were to go to the rest of the Qur'an, which is proper methodology, you cannot understand the part without <coughs> reference to the whole. You will find where, here is Surah Al-Nahr, verse number 15, that angels have no choice. No. When an angel is given a command, an angel must obey. So if you ask your wife to do something and she says she's not going to do it, she's not an angel, huh? <laughs> Angels must obey. They do what they have been ordered to do. If you had studied that verse of the Quran, you would then have understood, oh wait a minute, he disobeyed. So he could not have been an angel. And I've made a fool of myself with my inadequate methodology. And I've declared on Facebook he's an angel. And now my face is red with embarrassment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next one, tells us in Surah al they wrestle with this problem and many amongst the Christian scholars came to the conclusion that they don't call him Iblis I think they call him Lucifer that he was an angel but then he fell down. So he became a fallen angel. In order to accommodate the subject in their, uh, me with their methodology. Mm -hmm. This is a case of theological gymnastics. No, you're wrong. You use the wrong methodology. And Allah is teaching us methodology at the very beginning of the Quran, do not, do not, do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation. Do not take any verse of the Quran by itself to derive meaning and conclusion. Uh, proper methodology is to understand the part with reference to the whole and so now fasten your seat belts and put on your thinking caps because this is perhaps the most important part of the whole day and so proper methodology is that you have to go through the Quran to locate all, if I may be forgiven for using the word, all the data in the Quran, which is connected with this subject. 
and bring all that data together. And since the Quran is non-contradictory, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدَ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Had this Quran come from a source other than from Allah, you would have found in this Quran many instances of contradictions, inconsistencies, internally and externally. But there are no contradictions in the Quran. The to totality of the Quran is harmony. So when you have located all the data, all the data from the Quran, you have to bring all that data together in a harmonious whole. Integrate it together in a harmonious whole. To integrate all that data into a harmonious whole, you need not only knowledge, you need knowledge, so you got to do your homework, you got to do your homework. If you don't plant, you will not reap. And more than any other thing, it is in this subject that you got to plant if you want to reap. So you got to do your homework. To seek to integrate all that data from the Quran into a whole which will be a harmonious whole with no inconsistencies, no contradictions, and that is not an easy task. So don't attempt to run when you do not even as yet know how to creep. Be careful. But in addition to that, as every scientist would tell you, <laughs> all the major dif discoveries of science are like this. You need something more than the rational effort. effort. Something more than the cerebral effort. You need something called insight. And our chairman is the one who introduced you to insight. This is the third insight. And in this case, spiritual insight. And so the importance of the spiritual quest in Islam. The people who have distinguished themselves all through our history in the pursuit of the spiritual quest chose, I wish they had not done it, chose to give to their discipline the name of Tasawwuf or Sufism. If they had not done that, my life would have been so much easier. Yes. It was <laughs> Dr. Israr Ahmad Rahimahullah in Pakistan who first drew my attention to it. Why did they not stick with the term given by Jibreel alayhi salam, al-ihsan? If they had stuck with al-ihsan, stayed with that term, which is the same as tasawwuf, we wouldn't have all this jihad today against Sufis. Hmm? It is al-ihsan which delivers insight. So they can establish as many think tanks as they want in Washington or in Jerusalem. The doors of the Quran will forever remain closed to them. <laughs> they will never be able to penetrate the Quran. Unless Allah opens the door for them. And that door will be opened with insight. Insight. So go down on your musalla and pray and beg for knowledge. Beg for it. Oh Allah, they are asking for this and for that and the other. He wants a Mercedes Benz. He wants the most beautiful woman in the world. 
And he wants a house lovely as a castle. But this is all I ask for. This is all that I ask. Ask for it. For knowledge. And that knowledge would come to you with insight. And so you're able to bring the totality of the Quran on this particular subject. The totality of the data into a, an integrated and a harmonious whole. And only then you can now direct attention to the verse of the Quran. Uh, let me see. I think maybe I can do it. We still have some time. Here's an example. I was attending, I was invited by the Methodist Church in the United States to address a gathering of Methodist ministers from the United States, Canada, and from other parts of the world. Some came from the Arab world. And there were 200 of them in this hall in upstate New York. And I was invited to address them. I'm probably the only Muslim in the whole hall. And after I gave my talk, they're very polite people, the Americans. Ripple of applause and so on. Then one elderly minister got up, held up the Quran in his hands. Yusuf Ali. And incidentally, I forgot to mention, I have, I, I got Yusuf Ali and I got Muhammad Assad, the two most famous translations in English. And I got them from the publishers at the maximum discount, 30% maximum discount. And I'm passing them on to you at that discount. Okay, so if you want, you can get these copies uh, as soon as they have the first break. Uh, if you don't want to buy them, you can still use them and then put them back, but don't soil them. Sheikh, you mentioned in your talk how Muslims and Christians show respect for each other. And the Quran speaks so highly about Jesus. And, but what about this verse of the Quran? And then he started to read. And there's pin drop silence in the hall. O oh, you who have faith, do not take the Jews, and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies, their friends and allies of each other. I didn't know how to answer him. I didn't know how to answer him. I was fishing and I gave an answer which didn't convince them, the 200 ministers there, because I had not as yet applied proper methodology. It is when I applied proper methodology that I suddenly found that there was far more to this verse than you could find in the Tafasir, where they are directing attention to Christians at that time and Jews at that time, this tribe and that tribe and the other tribe. O oh, you who have faith in Allah, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Is Allah speaking of all Jews and all Christians? To answer that question, we've got to go to the whole Quran. And when we go to the rest of the Quran, it becomes very quickly, very clear that Allah could not have been speaking about all Jews and all Christians. Proper methodology saved us from the mistake. Proper methodology. We don't have the time to take you through all those verses. Well then, if Allah is not speaking about all Jews and all Christians, with which Jews and which Christians is he speaking about? Now the answer is right there. Meaning, do not take such Jews, and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies. Who themselves are friends and allies of each other. In other words, the Quran is anticipating a moment in time which is to come. 
when the Jewish Christian Alliance is going to be established. That Jewish Christian Alliance never came into being in Eastern Christianity. No. What used to be Byzantium, what the Quran refers to as Rome, Holy but a room. That Jewish Christian alliance came into being from Western Christianity, not Eastern Christianity. And that Jewish Christian alliance gave us Zionism. Christian Zionists and Jewish Zionists. And the military arm of that Christian Jewish alliance is NATO. The fools in Libya. The absolute fools in Libya didn't know this verse of the Quran. When they entered in alliance with NATO, their argument was we can take help from anywhere in the world, even from Satan, to achieve our objective. And they did make an alliance with Satan. And look where they've ended up. And if you make an alliance with them, You've lost your Islam. Here is a verse of the Quran which we can now understand for the first time in a new way. This is not to say that the meanings which were extracted in the tafasir are invalid, but that was not all. That was not all. The Quran is saying more. So proper methodology gave us a new way of understanding a verse of the Quran which prohibits Muslims from making friendship and alliance with a Judeo-Christian alliance, which today controls power in every part of the world except that part where Mr. Putin is in charge. Now then, we proceed. Proper methodology is not only that you take that which has come down from Allah, get the totality of the data, and bring it together as an integrated organic whole, but more than that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed a teacher. And you have to go to the teacher <laughs> to understand the book. But while the book is protected by Allah, inna nahnu nazalna zikr, Allah protects the book. Allah has not declared that he is going to protect what the teacher has taught. So the ahadith are not guaranteed by Allah for their authenticity. The Quran is guaranteed for its authenticity. Well then, how do we use the ahadith. There are those who write off all the ahadith. We are people of the Quran alone. They make a mistake. There are those who once a hadith is sahih, that's it. No one must ever question a sahih hadith, otherwise you lose your head. That's wrong. The Quran sits in judgment over the hadith. The Quran sits in judgment over the hadith. I forgot to mention, Dr. Ansari says that in order to bring all the verses of the Quran together in an organized, harmonious whole, you have to locate the common thread which binds them together. That common thread that he calls, he calls it the system of meaning. Don't try to translate it into Arabic, I don't think you'll get a translation. <laughs> the system of meaning which binds it all together. A scientist would understand because that's how scientific discovery, discoveries come. Hmm? Now then, having located the system of meaning of the subject from the verses of the Quran, now you turn to the ahadith of the Prophet 
and all the hadith which are capable of being fitted into that system of meaning will now be added to the database. This is very, very important. All the ahadis which can be harmoniously integrated into that system of meaning will now be added into the database. And what do you do with ahadis, even if they are sahih, which do not fit into this? What do you do? The question is, what do you do when a hadith is in conflict with the Quran? What do you do? The answer is, you stay with the Quran. Is there anyone who wants to challenge that? You have enough time later on. You stay with the Quran. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and the hadith is Sahih Bukhari you know it and she says that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam married me when I was six he married me when I was six I don't know about your part of the world but in Trinidad, where Nasheed and I come from, when you marry a girl, you can take her home. Once you marry her, you can take her home. She's yours. And more than that, you can close the doors. You can close the windows. And if anyone wants to come inside of the home to take a look, you can tell them, get out. They're private property here. So you can marry a six-year-old girl and take her home, and close the door, and close the windows. Hmm? The Prophet ﷺ married me when I was six, and consummated the marriage when I was nine. I'm not particularly concerned with that part. I'm concerned with the marriage part, six. Is this hadith in conformity with the Quran or is it in conflict with the Quran? If I marry a girl in Islam, she has a choice. I have to make a proposal of marriage and she has to accept or reject, usually through her wali. And if she says, no, you better go find somebody else. Because she has the right to say no. And if she does not have the right to say no, if she has no choice, the marriage is invalid. The marriage is invalid. Good. If the Prophet, alayhi salatu waslam, married her, the implication is that you have a nikah. And in order for a nikah to take place, she must have choice to say yes or no. But when Allah has decreed a matter, when Allah has decreed a matter, you don't have choice. She had no choice. So how can you have a nikah with someone who has no choice? The communication from Allah is she is your wife. Allah has already chosen her as your wife. Implicit in this statement is the marriage is already taking the place through Allah. If she is already divinely married to you, divinely married to you, how can you have a marriage ceremony here? Once Allah has married you to her, there is no marriage ceremony here. So there is a deficiency of language here. Instead of saying, he married me when I was six, 
It should have said, Allah married us. Not he married me. Allah married us. Okay? Once you notice this deficiency in language, that it should have been Allah married us, not he married me. You now are alerted. Alerted to this hadith. Now, marriage means that you have lawful sexual relations. Once you're married, you have lawful sexual relations. Is it permissible to have lawful sexual relations with a girl when she's six? When she's not as yet reached the age of puberty? When she's not as yet become a woman? Is it permissible for us to have sexual relations with a girl before she's become a woman? Is that permissible, yes or no? If you say yes, you're going to have to give us proof from Allah's book. I have avoided in my public lectures this part of the subject. But since we are a small gathering today, I'll give you a verse of the Quran. Allah speaks in the Quran and says about your woman. Excuse me. He says, Nisa'ukum harthul lakum. Your women are your fields that you plow. A farmer must plow the fields before he plants the seed. So your women are your fields, implicit in that, fields that you plow. Fa'atu harthakum. So, go to your fields, plow your fields, in any way or fashion you wish. The uh, asbabu tanzil of this uh, uh, ayah of the Quran is that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had sexual relations with his wife, but not in the missionary form, from, from on the back. And uh, the Jews declared that if the baby is born, it's going to be squint eye. And the matter came before the Prophet. And this revelation came down to Bilai, that wrong notion that the Jews had. The Jews had. No, you're entitled to have sexual relations in any pose, in any form. Provided, provided that it is a field that is being plowed. Okay? The field becomes a field only when a seed can be planted and if Allah allows germination, it can germinate. Only then can it be called a field. Can a six-year-old girl be considered to be a field? That if you plant a seed, the possibility exists that it can fertilize and grow. Answer? No, of course not. Of course not. And so I have come to the conclusion, if others defer with me, they have the right to do so. But they must do it publicly, not in privately. That it is not permissible in Islam. To have sexual relations with a girl unless and until she's become a field, meaning she has reached the age of puberty. So that if you plant a seed, it has the chance of fertilizing and she can become pregnant. If you marry a girl before that and you're not allowed to have sexual relations with her, but you are allowed to take her home, are we going to have to install cameras in the home? Huh? To ensure you don't uh, do anything with her? Doesn't make sense to me. I know that the Australian government has great concerns about Australian citizens 
who are pedophiles. I'm not bad talking Australia, I'm talking about the Australian government. If we say that women are allowed, you can marry a girl at age six in Islam, every Australian pedophile will want to become Muslim. <laughs> this is not ungracious language on my part. No. So no Australian should be annoyed with me because the Australian government has enacted legislation, I believe. We have some Australians here. Yeah. So have they enacted legislation? Yeah. I believe they have enacted legislation now that you can, be, you can be prosecuted in Australia. If you go to Indonesia, for example, and do such a thing, you come back home, they can prosecute you in Australia. And so I have come to the conclusion that this hadith is in conflict with the Quran. And so if a case comes before the Sharia court in Egypt, what should the Sharia court do? Here is an Egyptian couple with a six-year-old daughter. And here's a man who is 55 years old and choose a particularly ugly looking man. Not like Dr. Omar Zaid, his wife makes him look very handsome. Uh, my wife is also doing a good job, inshallah. <laughs> So you choose a, an ugly looking 55 year old and you have CNN and Al Jazeera there to capture it and the mother comes before the Egyptian Sharia court. What is the court to do? If you adopt the proper methodology, you would throw out the case because this hadith is in conflict with the Quran. Layajus. But if you adopt the wrong methodology, you will say since the hadith says that Nabi Muhammad married her when she was six. The implication is that marriage with a girl at the age of six is permissible in Islam. And when that marriage takes place and CNN and Al Jazeera capture it, it's going to be repeated over and over again on every television station in the world. And we're going to become the laughing stock of the world. I met with Dr. Muhammad Mahathir, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, about maybe two months ago. And very strangely, he was very much interested in this subject. He spent most of the time with me talking on this subject. And when I said to him, Dr. Mahathir, we're going to become the laughing stock of the world. He said to me, we are already the laughing stock of the world. <laughs> One more. Proper methodology and wrong methodology. Because this is crucial, crucial, crucial to the study of Akhirul Zaman. That's why I stopped the bus so you can get out and walk around a bit. The Quran sits in judgment over the hadith. Proper methodology. The hadith, even sahih hadith, do not have the same status as the Quran, proper methodology. If you do not hold on to this, you cannot handle Akhiru Zaman. Because I'm warning you, there are fabricated hadith planted there. And you're gonna stop, you're gonna step on a time bomb. <laughs> so you need proper methodology to be able to handle Akhirul Zaman. Hmm? When we arrived in Medina after the Hijrah, we prayed in the direction of Jerusalem. We turned our backs to Mecca. No Arab could do that and survive. How can you turn your back to the Kaaba and you're an Arab? But we did it. The Jews were stunned. They knew that a prophet was coming to Medina. That's why they were there in Medina. Come on, Rabbi, don't hide it. That's why you were there. And here he is. But he's not a Jew. He's an Arab. And that stunned them. 
he is facing Jerusalem in performing his salat. There is evidence as dazzling as the sunshine, this man must, must be a prophet of Allah. He did more than that. He fasted with the Jews on the days when they fasted and in accordance with the law of fasting in the Torah. No Arab ever fasted like that. From sunset to sunset, no food, that's difficult. From sunset to sunset, no drink, that's difficult. And from sunset to sunset and no wives, that's impossible. <laughs> but we fasted like that. When we fasted like that with the Jews on the days when they fasted in accordance with their law of fasting, here's evidence as dazzling as the sunshine, this man could not have been other than a prophet of Allah. But then they made a plan. They made a plan to fix him up. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. They brought two people who had confessed to zina. O oh, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, you judge the case. He asks, what do you do? They were stunned. They didn't expect that. Oh, 